In this video, we're going to be discussing a challenge to free will that comes from cognitive psychology rather than neuroscience. We'll be looking at an argument and view developed by the psychologist Daniel Wegner related to notions of automatic behavior and free will. In this video, we'll start out by talking about the view known as hard determinism and the problem posed by our experience of free will. Then we'll look at Wegner's view on how that experience is an illusory experience of free will. We'll look at some data on automatic psychological processes involving some automographs and some data on facilitated communication. Then we'll turn to Wegner's argument itself. Earlier, we discussed a view known as hard determinism. So remember, that was the view that accepts the following ideas. First, they believe that determinism is true, that everything that ever happens in our universe, including every decision that you or I ever make, was determined to happen by prior causes. They also believe in compatibilism. So they believe that that kind of determinism is incompatible with our having free will. Thus, they conclude that human beings just do not have free will. So this kind of hard determinism has a problem insofar as it seems to contradict our own subjective experiences of our own decisions. What I mean by this is, when I went to graduate school for philosophy, I had to decide between different schools that had accepted me. And when I was making my decision, it felt like all of those schools were options that were open to me. It felt like I could have just as easily chosen any one of those schools as the others. It didn't feel as if my decision was already determined before I made it. It felt like I was in control of that decision, and it felt like I could use my own conscious thoughts about the programs, the locations, the funding packages to decide for myself which of those options I was going to take. Now, many people think we ought to treat our experiences as sort of innocent until proven guilty. The idea is that our experiences can go wrong. You can see things that aren't there. You can hear things that aren't there. You can feel things that aren't there. But they think as a general policy, we should think that our experiences are generally reliable so that they are usually accurate. If you see thing, if you see something, you should assume it's there until you get some reason to think that your experience is an illusion. Now, hard determinism implies that our experience of free will is inaccurate, that the way we experience our own decisions is mistaken. And so... In addition to providing evidence for determinism itself, a hard determinist should also offer some explanation for how our brains sort of create this illusion or experience of free will when there isn't actually free will. And so Daniel Wegner is one of the main scientists attempting to sort of explain where this illusion, this experience comes from. Part of Wegner's support for the idea that our experience of free will is an illusion came from Libet's experiments. What I've put in here is a picture of the way that Libet thought about these events. He thought in the experiment where subjects were asked to flex their wrist, we first saw unconscious brain activity that then caused a sort of experience of an urge to flex their wrist or a sort of conscious sort of awareness of a decision to flex their wrist, which then caused the action. Wegner thought that this picture that Libet was drawing was mistaken. So here's the alternative picture that Wegner proposes. He thinks that the conscious experience of will in your action, so you thinking in your mind, I'm going to flex now, and then your action, actually flexing your wrist, are both caused by the same thing. They're both caused by the unconscious brain activity. But he thinks your experience of thinking in your own mind, I'm going to flex now, does not cause your action at all. It's all caused by the unconscious brain activity. Why does it feel otherwise? Well, in your experience, you feel the sort of thought, I'm going to flex now. And then slightly later than that, you see your wrist flex and you feel your wrist X. So the purple little bubbles here sort of re represent what is showing up in your experience. But what's not showing up in your experience is the unconscious brain activity. The only thing you're aware of is your thought, I'm going to flex now, and then you're aware of your flexing ever so slightly after you have that thought. And so Wegner thinks it's similar to, to a video that I will show you on the next slide. Let's take a look.
in that video, it really does look like the red square causes the green square to move. It looks like it's bumping into the green square and sort of pushing it across the screen. But in reality, that's not what's happening. The red square doesn't cause the green square to move at all. They're both just images on a screen. The movement of both squares on the screen is caused by the sort of programming that created the video. So both movements have a common cause. Our experience of causation in that little movie clip is an illusion. And the illusion arises because we are first aware of, we see the red square move. And then we're also aware of, we also see the green square move right after we see the red square sort of reach it. However, we're not aware of the program that's sort of working behind the scenes to cause both of these images to move one after the other. And because of that, since we're only aware of the red square moving and then the green square moving, we experience it as if the first thing causes the second thing to happen. Let's watch again. So Wegner thinks that something similar is happening in the Libet experiment. What happens in your experience, in your sort of conscious thought, is first you're aware of the conscious thought, I'm going to flex now. Or you're aware of your sort of feeling of the urge to flex your wrist. Then slightly, like right after that, you see and feel your wrist move. And because in your experience, you only experience the first thing and then right after the second thing, it feels like the first thing causes the second thing. So that's what the dotted purple line represents, is that you feel as if the first thing in your sort of conscious awareness causes the second thing you're aware of, the action. But in reality, it, that's because you're not aware of the unconscious brain activity that's causing both of them. In reality, what's happening is the unconscious brain activity causes the experience of the thought, I'm going to flex now, or the feeling of that urge to flex. And it also causes your flexing that you see and feel later. In reality, there is no causal relation between your conscious thought or the feeling of that urge and the action itself. So why should we believe Wegner's picture that our conscious thoughts do not actually cause our actions, that both those things are just caused by unconscious brain activity? Well, like I said, he appeals to Libet's experiment as part of his support, We've already discussed some of the problems with Libet's experiment, but he has some further reasons to try to support this illusion of free will. In order to support this picture of how our mind causes our behavior, uh, Daniel Wegner appeals to what in psychology is sometimes called automatic processes. So these are psychological processes that take place without much attention or effort and without any sort of conscious awareness. So an example here might be when you're sort of driving a car sort of metaphorically on autopilot. If you've ever had that experience where you're sort of driving home and then all of a sudden you get home and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't really remember sort of doing those things, but somehow I drove home. You were driving, you were doing these things, you were turning, you were staying in your lane, you were going the right directions, but you weren't consciously thinking about what you were doing as you were doing it. You were doing it without your attention, without putting in much effort, and without your subconscious sort of awareness on those actions. Those are the automatic processes. And so Wegner appeals to various experiments to illustrate these kinds of examples where automatic processes can cause our behavior without any conscious intention or thought. The idea is there's a certain stimulus and it, our brains have automatically processed that stimulus to produce a response. So the first kind of experiment that Wegner appeals to uses what's called an automatograph that detects hand movements. Here's a picture of the machine. So you put your fingers on there, and then what can happen is the experimenter will manipulate the environment or suggest certain ideas that will then get the subject to automatically move their hand in various ways without thinking about it, without trying. So they have no conscious intention to perform this behavior. As an example, they might put a metronome in the room and the person might start tapping their finger on the automatograph to the beat of the music without realizing it, without trying. This is a familiar experience, I think. 
If you listen to music, you might all of a sudden find yourself sort of tapping your foot on the floor to the beat of the music without trying. I know this happens to me all the time because I'll start sort of drumming on my desk and then my wife will yell at me because I'm annoying her and then I'll realize what I'm doing and think, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was doing that. And then five minutes later after I stop, I'll do it again without realizing. Uh, another version of this uh, experiment is they have people put their hand on the automatograph and beforehand, they were supposed to hide something in the room. And then the experimenter comes in and they mention this thing that they hid. Uh, and then without even realizing it, the person with their hand on the automatic will slightly move their hand in the direction of the place that they hid this sort of toy or whatever it was. Uh, I mean, you sort of see this kind of phenomena all the time if you watch detective shows. Um, maybe the detectives come in to uh, interview uh, a suspect and the suspect has some kind of evidence hidden in their sort of room and the sort of detective will notice that this person keeps on looking, say, maybe at their desk because they have something hidden there and the detective will be like, why do you keep looking at that desk? And the idea is, that idea of this piece of evidence was suggested to them by the sort of uh, detective. And even though they have no intention of sort of trying to sort of look at where they sort of hit it, they, their sort of brain sort of automatically gets this behavior to happen sort of unconsciously without thinking about it. So this is the first kind of experimental evidence that's used to try to sort of illustrate how a stimulus how a sort of certain suggestion in the environment can automatically produce sort of behavior without any sort of conscious intention to do so. The second kind of example that Wegener appeals to is via the history of facilitated communication. So this was a technique developed to help people with severe autism and cerebral palsy communicate with the help of a trained facilitator the facilitators would pay attention to which keys the subjects were trying to push on a keyboard, and then they would push those buttons for them to spell out the words and thoughts. The idea was that by using the facilitator then, the patient would be able to communicate their own thoughts and ideas. So the facilitator is not supposed to sort of type these things out themselves. They're supposed to try to figure out what the patient is trying to push so that the patient can communicate their thoughts. It turned out, however, that everything the facilitators wrote was coming from their own mind rather than from the sort of patient's mind. They were in control of what was being typed, even though they weren't trying to. They weren't trying to mislead anyone. Uh, I mean, at least a lot of them weren't. And so they had no conscious intention to come up with these, or write these things themselves. This is similar to something you might be familiar with, the idea of a, a Ouija board. So a Ouija board, if you don't know what it is, it's got all these sort of letters on it, yes, no, numbers, and uh, people put their fingers on this object that's in the middle with that sort of clear uh, plastic part or glass part that is supposed to highlight various letters or yes or no or various numbers. And so the idea is you get multiple people around the board, you put your fingers on this sort of object in the middle, and then you ask a question. And the claim is that spirits are then going to move this object and spell out answers to those questions. A, a way to communicate with the spirits. Now, some people sort of swear by this. They say, yes, you're actually able to communicate with spirits this way because all of a sudden this object will start moving and they'll swear that they're not moving it because they're not thinking about any of these sort of answers. It just sort of happens uh, and they don't intend to move it themselves. But in reality, if you actually measure what's going on, you can notice there is force being applied from their fingers ever so slightly, such that even though they're not consciously thinking about these thoughts and ideas, they are the ones moving it without even realizing it. Right, and so this is how sort of automatic processes can automatically produce this sort of behavior. At this point, you might be thinking, so what? What do these automatic processes have to do with cases where our behavior feels if it's, as if it's under our control, free, and not automatic? So yet again, when I 
grab my Diet Coke and take a drink. It, that doesn't feel like something that's automatic. It feels like something I am consciously thinking about and in control of. Well, Wegner says, so this is a quote that Mealy brings up in his discussion uh, from Wegner's The Illusion of Conscious Will. It says, it has to be one way or the other. Either the automatisms are oddities against the general backdrop of conscious behavior, subconscious behavior causation in everyday life, or we must turn everything around quite radically and begin to think that behavior that occurs with a sense of will is somehow the odd case, an add-on to a more basic underlying system. And so the idea here is it's simpler to think that our actions are caused in the same way. In these automatic cases, we already have mechanisms that can take us from stimulus to response. We don't need conscious thoughts in order to explain how the behavior is produced. It looks like the better explanation, the simpler explanation, is that those conscious thoughts are just an extra thing that's not needed to explain our behavior. So this leads us to Wegner's automaticity argument. Premise 1 says... Some human behavior is not even partly caused by our conscious intentions to perform those actions. So this is the examples of the automatograph and the facilitated communications. These are behaviors we're doing where no one's forcing us to do these things. No one's grabbing our hands and moving them for us. We're not having an epileptic seizure. And the idea is we have these examples where there's these automatic processes that produce our actions without any conscious intention. Then he says, all human actions are caused in basically the same way. If we have a mechanism that can explain our behavior, well, then the simplest explanation is that's how all of our behavior is caused. So no human actions are even partly caused by our conscious intentions to perform those actions. But people only have free will if their behavior is sometimes caused by their conscious intentions. Thus, Human beings do not have free will. The conscious thoughts that we have are not in control of our behavior. It's the automatic processes happening underneath the surface of consciousness. It only feels like our conscious thoughts are in control because we are unaware of the unconscious brain behavior that's really pulling the strings. And we're only aware of the conscious thought and then aware of the action right after. And so we infer that the conscious thought is in control, even though it's not. So that's it for this video. Next time, we're going to be looking at the problems for Wagner's argument and how someone might try to defend free will from this challenge. See you then.